just an amazing, amazing colleague. Um, and I just want to share for context, we've been, the lab has been working at this intersection of, of, of climate and performance for a long time, but it's a particularly auspicious moment because there's a new School of the Environment and Earth Commons that we're really a deep partner with and helping to imagine and shape, looking ahead, a distinctive, uh, not only curriculum, but kind of program and platform around how the arts and performance and the really critical issues around the climate and the environment that all of these folks are passionate about and working on can, um, can intersect. So this conversation is not just a reporting out of amazing work, but we really see it as generative and catalytic as we start to work with Pete Mara, uh, the visionary director of the Earth Commons, to sort of really um, here at Georgetown and, and beyond, think about the lab as a kind of center for this work. So we want all of you in that conversation, and today uh, will be an amazing way to start it. So I'm gonna hand it over to our moderator, our amazing uh, Global Lab fellow, Abner Delina, who will make sure everyone else gets it. <coughs> so enjoy our wonder. Thank you so much, Derek. <laughs> and thank you to our audiences here. Uh, I am Abner Torres Delina Jr. I come from the Philippines, I was born and raised there. And I'm uh, grateful and honored to be here, especially this afternoon, to be sharing this space with very wonderful beings who are working for our Earth. <laughs> and today, um, we are uh, called to this conversation, Our One Earth, Artists Engaging Climate. Um, before I continue um, with them, uh, I also want to just take a moment for us to um, perhaps invite you to uh, close your eyes um, for a moment and just take a deep breath and just listen to all the sounds that you can hear right now and try to zone into all the sounds that you can hear inside your body. And if it would help to put your, both your hands on your heart like a dove just feel your heartbeat and how the air flows inside you. And in every breath you take, I want you to notice how this air flows and travels and where it goes and where it hides and where it moves and how it lands back to your own body and how we share this same space right now. And just to give a moment to acknowledge the abundance that we have in this moment. The air, the land, the fire, the water, and all other life systems that help us balance this ecology. And for a second, be more intentional as we listen to each other and this topic on climate of what your heart is speaking to right now. Thank you. Um, as I've said, uh, glad to be uh, sharing this space with you tonight, uh, today. Um, and we'll be discussing um, climate um, in, a, in an hour or less. <clears throat> and um, <laughs> right now, <clears throat> It, I would already say that um, if only we could <laughs> do that and solve that in an hour, um, but it won't give justice definitely. So I'm excited how this conversation continues afterwards. Um, and then just to give you a bit of background, um, we'll ask each panel to introduce themselves and how they're entering into this context. And then after which they uh, could share the local problems that they encounter in their own communities, um, uh, locally or in their countries and after which we'll see more of their works and um, we'll see the exchanges that happens after. Um, and if we are lucky to have more time, then perhaps we could do a question or two. Um, all right, so um, let's start. I've introduced myself and um, uh, to tell you more, uh, I am leading a multi-arts collective called Black Canvas, which is dealing with um, the intersections of care culture, global justice and um, ecological healing. And it's also geared towards really um, fostering artistic leadership among young artists um, to be dealing with these um, through community engagement and collaborations. 
And so far, um, I have directed works with Department of Education, Disaster Risk Reduction Management Services, um, and still am working on their projects for climate advocacy shows um, and writing toolkit for, for this. Um, recently, I've also been uh, part of the ITAC uh, International Teaching Artists Collaborative Climate Artists for this year, which allows me to do uh, one local project on community leadership in Cadiz City, Negros Occidental, in the Philippines. Um, that's for me, and I'm excited to listen more from you, Maya. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first, I want to just thank Abner for introducing us to this space, and I want to thank everyone who's present in it to have this discussion about our Earth, but also an extension of ourselves. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Maya Smith. I am an alum from Georgetown University, graduated May of 2020 when the pandemic was really picking up. I remember <laughs> going for spring break, coming back to campus, like, everybody move off. So it's so great to be back in this space after so long. I wanted to start with that. Um, I am an advocate for healing and I'm an advocate for our, our planet. And as an advocate, I often think about sustainability. When we talk about environment, we think of nature, plants and animals. And so a lot of what I'm doing is thinking more of sustainability, how we connect human people and our society with the institutions that help structure our society alongside our natural environment and also still acknowledging like the history that comes with that and like the future that we get to create. Uh, more tangibly, I'm, a, I'm currently teaching English to kids learning English in Baltimore City and we just finished up a unit on climate and it was really amazing to see students who come into class, can't write paragraphs, uh, struggle with speaking English and seeing the work that they produce by the end of our project. And um, I'm happy to be here this evening to have a conversation with this panel. So thank you. Thank you, um, Maya. Yes, snaps to that. <laughs> um, and yes, uh, Orfan? Yeah, Orfan. <laughs> yes. Uh, Bismillah rahman rahim My name is Saeed Orfan Abizadeh, and I'm a high school student. So I'm, I just came to the United States. It has been like seven or eight months. Uh, last month, we were on the same panel discussion, Maya and I, with uh, Mr. Gur, the former vice president of the United States. <clears throat> and. Um, uh, beside that, I'm a climate activist, and it has been like for seven or eight years that I'm uh, doing uh, climate activism and environmentalism. So I'm grateful to be here and have a wonderful conversation with our fellow uh, and with you. And yeah. Yes, thank you, Orfan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, yeah. Really wonderful work there. Um, yes, uh, please, Katie. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Pearl, and I am the co-artistic director of a theater company called Pearl D'Amour. It's a, about a 25-year collaboration mm -hmm. with the playwright Lisa D'Amour. Uh, and I also teach theater at Wesleyan University. Um, and I think I come to this conversation as somebody who makes uh, pretty theatricalized gestures that invite our audiences to consider their own relationship to this question and um, reality of the environment. Perhaps they're people who don't, haven't had to think about that. And so our pieces try to create space for that. And I'll talk about a couple of them today. Great, yeah, we'll see more of Katie's work um, later on. And uh, lastly, <laughs> yes, Katie. Yay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm really honored to be here next to such <coughs> wonderful beings. Um, my name is Kio. I'm a current lab fellow. Uh, I'm from Mexico. I studied history, but then I rebelled from the academy, and now I'm a performance artist. It's been four and a half years now, and I use my body to fight uh, against gender violence and the uh, constant and insatiable looting of our land resources. And I'm based in Guadalajara, Mexico. And well, I, I'm here uh, at this panel because I think that earth caring is a revolutionary act, like Cynthia say, it said yesterday, yesterday. This is my little revolution and it's also like in times like this, Earth caring is resisting and it's going against 
the heteropatriarchal narrative where where there is like this impossibility of creating <coughs> other futures so i think earth caring and fighting the system that really turns me on you know so yeah. <laughs> it's yeah <laughs> is that a clue okay <laughs> so that's it um, <laughs> Uh, thank you, Kyo. Um, uh, I share this last uh, this fellowship with Kyo for 2021 and 20 to 2023 for the Global Lab Fellows. So, yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, I think I, I'm more interested now with where you're coming from. Uh, what are the problems in your local community or country, or um, if you can be more specific of this moment of encounter? Like, oh, I'm going to deal with this problem. I'm going to deal with this issue um, that you know is related to climate. But of course, we know that it's systemic. Um, there's intersectional um, perspectives there. But uh, yeah, I'd, l I'd love to know. Um, anyone can start, uh, can share? I can go first. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you uh, very much again. So I'm coming from Afghanistan. Uh, many of you, like uh, as I told Mr. Gore and the audience last month uh, to the, uh, where I was on the panel discussion with them, I told them that everyone in the United States and Western countries and in the international community, they think that Afghanistan is just war. There is just poverty. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is funny that uh, last week I was writing an article with one of my friends uh, at my school about climate change in Afghanistan, about uh, poverty, hunger, and starvation. And he asked me, what should, we, uh, what should we put the title of the article's name? I said that I think we have to put the title's name um, Afghanistan's uh, Hidden Struggles. Because climate change, uh, no one knows what's going on in Afghanistan, what the people are dealing with climate change. For example, two days ago on Thursday, there was a flooding and there was storms in 12 provinces of Afghanistan. I have the number. Uh, 500 houses uh, has been destroyed. 2,000 has been damaged. Uh, 300 head of livestock killed and some 3,000 acres, acres of crops damaged. And about 30 people have been killed and 40 uh, others have been injured. So my community uh, is dealing with a lot of, a lot of problems. We have a lot of issues right now in Afghanistan. We are dealing with a lot of things. Uh, everyone knows that now we have, we have hunger. 25 million people are uh, there under uh, the line of poverty, and they're in urgent need of uh, food. Mm. But uh, have we ever thought about climate change? What's going on in Afghanistan with climate change? No. Um, when I was in Afghanistan, when I was like eight or nine years old, um, I've, I've, I've witnessed that many people are dying in Afghanistan. I thought that it might be just war, bombing, killing. No, but I, I did research. I researched about the situation in Afghanistan. I found out that yearly 20 to 30,000 people are dying because of climate impacts, such as droughts. Now there is an ongoing huge droughts in our region, in Afghanistan, in India, in Pakistan, in Iran, and in Central Asia. But the center of this uh, drought is Afghanistan. Now Afghanistan is, it is a volatile state. No one cares about Afghanistan. Since the, uh, the war in Ukraine started, Afghanistan is, is being forgotten by the international community. No one knows where is Afghanistan. Last year when I just came, when I just arrived to the United States, uh, one, of my, one of my schoolmates, one of my friends asked me that, what do you have in Afghanistan? Do you have electricity? Do you have power? Do you have car? We have to care about Afghanistan. We have to care not ab just Afghanistan. We have to care about those countries that are, that are impacted mm -hmm. and being impacted by climate change. Sure. Kabul city, the capital of Afghanistan. Last year, 
in 2020, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, from January to March of 2021, mm. each week, 8,000 people were visiting hospital because of what? It was not because of bombing or because of killing. It was because of air pollution. The size of Afghan uh, Kabul city is very small. It's very small. It's a smaller, maybe, it's, uh, the size of a Kabul city, maybe it's the same size of Washington, D.C. But the population is about 6 million. There is 1 million car. There is, uh, air pollution is really devastating the lives of Kabul citizens. Mm -hmm. So this is Kabul, about Afghanistan generally and entirely. Mm -hmm. We have some neighbors. I told Mr. Gur last month that India and China, they're our neighboring countries. They're emitting carbon emissions. But those carbon emissions, they're coming to our country. And our people are suffering from those carbon emissions. <coughs> we, have, we have water pollution. 80% of Afghanistan's population, they do not have access to clean water. Because of what? Because of insufficient infrastructure and the usage of groundwater. Yes, and um, you may ask that, oh yeah, we invested in Afghanistan two trillion dollars. We have invested in Afghanistan for 20 years. That's right, I don't deny that. Yeah, that's completely true. But we had some problems that international community had to focus on that. We had corruption in our, gov in our government. Now, we don't have government in Afghanistan. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't have any government. <clears throat> there was like two or 300 climate activists, including me. I was not just climate activist. Mm -hmm. I was also peace, civil rights, women rights, and human rights activist. Mm -hmm. I was working <coughs> closely with high schoolers, middle schoolers, with college students, with university students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was a part of an organization. We were organizing some conferences, some uh, sessions, uh, for youths and for adults to come and to share their ideas, to share their uh, thoughts with us, we have to find solutions for that. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, um, suddenly everything changed and we don't have, right now, we don't have anything in Afghanistan. Yeah. Okay. Um, Irfan, thank you so much for sharing that and for, your, uh, for the clarities, for, for the facts. Um, and it seems to me that this, this is where you're coming from, of the, your first-hand experience of there's um, immense um, care um, for all these issues because this is happening to your people. That's and I could say likewise in the Philippines where it seems that when we talk about climate, just for the beginners or those who have just entered the space into this conversation on climate, that it seems um, like we're waiting for a doom. But the idea of climate um, emergency is uh, already happening now in many spaces, and it's not like we're waiting for this next storm. Um, it is affecting all our food systems, labor, um, safety, security, um, and thus, yeah, the, the crisis is really in the gaps and the injustices more than the, the effect itself. Um, and how prepared we are with this. And I think later I'm excited to learn more on how you respond to this like with your practices. So first, like I want, is this is ring true with in yeah. your communities or where you're, and when we talk of communities, it can be just your, your school, your, your country. Yes, what Maya. What shared really resonates with me because <clears throat> he's pulling in from his personal experience and that's where it begins, right? When you think about the climate crisis, it begins with your proximity to space, mm -hmm. the physical space, your environmental space, but also your social space, your political space, your nationality, culture. And I think, you know, I couldn't help but, um, I'm, just, I'm just so proud of you, Erfan, and like what you are doing. Because at the core, what you're reflecting is acknowledging what is happening in the space around you. And, and like you, Irfan, I grew up in east of the Anacostia River in northeast Washington, D.C. And I make that distinction because when you think about a river, a river is such a divisive tool that divides people. And there are 
countless injustices happening globally. And the School of Foreign Service, you know, encountering the social, political, and environmental crises <clears throat> happening abroad, to have you sitting here on this stage, an audience to hear you, to hold witness to the climate crisis is happening all around us. The emergency, the climate emergency is now. And so when I think about my own proximity to that, I think back to just growing up here in the nation's capital of this country mm -hmm. and the amount of injustice, the amount of disordering that is interwoven within how we practice our society. When you think about gender, you think about race, you think about class, and all of those have impacts that are a reflection of how we treat our environment. It includes all of those things. And so I wanna thank you for like bringing that into our conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for highlighting that uh, too, Maya. Um, Katie, uh, Keo, you wanna like share briefly, like is there like a close encounter to, to these certain problems in your community that allows you to say, respond? through your art uh, later on? I think in um, juxtaposition to what Erfan was talking about in terms of being on the front <clears throat> lines, or even Maya was talking about, I feel like one of the things that we're trying to respond to is um, people in our circles lack of ability to feel that encounter. Mm -hmm. Like the, the climate, climate crisis feels can feel so theoretical mm. to so many of us still, even though the globe is in the middle of a climate mm. emergency. And so trying to respond by saying like, how can we use this kind of storytelling to wake up imagination, wake up um, awareness, create possibilities for a relationship for people who aren't, aren't feeling the direct impacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I understand that you're also Dealing with this in the context of like the university, working with different sectors, right? Yeah. And um, seeing opportunities there to change something in, in the policies. And I'm sure we can hear more about that um, later. Um, Kio, uh, would you want to share like what's, what's with Mexico? How do you feel mm -hmm. that um, this I, climate emergency? I think what you just said, Katie, about people not knowing how to deal with like such a catastrophe that it apparently is inevitable, or that's what we're told. And it has to do, I think, with also a lot of ecological guilt and that paralyzing us. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that what we have right now, like this initiative, art is like a great tool to shake off all that ecological guilt and to find new ways to relate with our environment because I'm hearing about uh, polluted rivers, I'm hearing about polluted air, and it resonates because it's the same in Mexico in my city. I know contexts are completely different, but at the core, it's the same problems right, right now. In, in Guadalajara, we're suffering from monoculture, like excessive monoculture, like the agave plantations to make tequila have gotten so massive and on the outskirts of the city it's it's three problems the agave plantations the berries and the the avocados so they just take everything off like all of the endemic plants and they do this massive massive fields of monoculture and they are calling it like the agave landscape and there's like a lot of tourists coming but what what many people don't know is that this is very, very bad for, for the land it's itself and for pollinators, which I will be talking about, yeah. about pollinators afterwards, but it's, it's, it's terrible. And I mean, what I wanna say is that we're, I mean, we're all in this together no matter where we are in the world, whether it's the States, whether it's Afghanistan, mm -hmm. the Philippines, or Mexico. Yes, um, and it's, as I was invited here, I, uh, my first reaction was like, oh, it's interesting, you know, I'm moderating it, um, I'm coming from a country who's um, really high, one of the highest vulnerable to the perils of the crisis of the climate um, uh, um, disasters, and yet we are the least contributor to the problem. And how unfair is that, right? To be here in this land right now, to be sharing this space, and knowing that the people, my people are dying, are, are, are literally dying, and we don't know when is the next flood, 
<coughs> in this locality, and all of a sudden, like, they're just numbers. All of a sudden, like, you know, you hear high end, and I mean, what can donations do, really? <laughs> um, uh, it's just absurd, uh, really, all these gaps. And uh, through the years, this has been clear to me that um, the problems of the climate did not start just yesterday. Or like, it started from when we were <laughs> extracted by so many things, <laughs> you know, but from when we were robbed by so many opportunities to grow as a country. It started when we were colonized, and we are still, um, uh, and we are traumatized as a land, and it's archipelagic, and it's even already hard to think of nation as a concept in such like 7,100 plus islands. And then, you know, we have here <laughs> um, this, this crisis. So people have, don't, uh, don't have time. And from the grassroots, they, they just wait for the next storm to come, you know, and then wait for the next donation. And it's sad, it's a sad narrative. Um, I have so many stories to tell, of course. So we kind of want to be very strategic about this. And when I enter the lab, this is what I tell them. Like, I think we have to be in this kind of conversation to make changes, but at the same time, um, it happens in our, on a grassroots level. So it happens all the same time. And for sure, you also contribute to the solutions. Sometimes you also contribute to the problem. So now let's go into a more creative um, <laughs> way of approaching this, because um, some of us, uh, luckily, are gifted with this language of and how are you, can you share more about that? So we have roughly a you know, few minutes each to, to share your, your works because there's no other way to communicate that to the people, like um, how they could also access that or, yeah. you know, and, enter your space. Yeah. And to Kia's point, like art is so exciting because I think it was, um, I was here during like the alumni uh, reunion and one thing that I think Ashani Kodage had said was, that artists are meant to create art at times like this because that's when all of us are really looking for something beautiful. And I think we've forgotten the beauty of our planet and the beauty of our human civilization. And we need to like, we have to get reconnected to ourselves and to each other, to our nations, to our people and, and all people beyond all borders because we share the planet, we share this world, therefore we share the burdens, we share the scary stuff, we also share the beauty and we also all have opportunity to create something really beautiful now mm -hmm. and moving forward despite what we are coming from. Um, so I we think, hear you. yes, we and, hear and you. And that's what I wanna, wanna ask. Like, do, you, yeah. do you have something to share to us? Like, with, what's up with We Hear You? How was yes. that experience? What is it like, like for, um, for people who don't know? Loved Up Theater Company, Caitlin, The Lab, they're just doing such amazing and great work. I can't even begin to articulate all the amazing people and groups involved in creating this movement, which really is grounded in deep listening, listening of oneself, listening of one's community, listening of the world, um, and then the projects that they're doing, creating platforms to have conversations like these. You have to talk about the things that are kind of hard to talk about, even if you don't have the language and the pretty little words. <laughs> like, you have to begin, and um, this past, uh, this past month, as Erfan was sharing, we had an opportunity to perform at the Kennedy Center, perform at the Reach, to help you know remind these conversations uh, over at the Coal and Ice exhibit. And doing the project has been really transformational for me because it's making me consider and reaffirm my own proximity to activism and creating positive change. And so. What I encourage all of us to do in this space is just to continue to, to listen and observe in the capacities that we can mm -hmm. and to make the changes and the movements in the ways that we can mm -hmm. and trust that we're surrounded in community with people who are doing the same. Yes. Who are, yeah. Is there anything that we could uh, see or watch or um, a, a oh. website perhaps uh, that, that where we could like check more about this, we hear you. So yes. they search, we hear you, and then they could read more about this. Now for yes. sure, like there are people who the, wrote about it. They are launching a website. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot, I, for, <laughs> I don't have the, it's okay. Do we, for today, so. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> but, but there are, they're launching a website, they're gonna do another performance in Sweden, and there's a lot to be, there's a lot to come, and um, I guess I could perform a small yeah. excerpt from, from the performance itself. Sure. Um, give me one second as I pull up. My, my script. Um, Take space. So I think I'll begin. This is just to give a little preface. This is the closing of the performance itself. Um, 
and I'll begin. So in the year 2078, I will celebrate my 80th birthday. If I have children, then maybe they will spend that day with me. Maybe they will ask about you. We've come here to let you know that change is coming, whether we like it or not. The real power belongs to the people. I'm fighting to heal. I'm headed towards recovery. It's okay to be scared. Not all scary things hurt. And just because things are scary doesn't mean they are unsafe. But we are hurting in a world that's sick, tired, and scared. But I won't be other anymore. I'm going to find us, a place to be safe and healed. So to you, I ask, when? When will you join us? When and where will we choose to be? I don't have much more to say, but I am here to show you. I hear our voices calling out to me from wherever we stand together. I'm being pulled towards that place and time where we exist. And I am here to remind you that it is possible only if we transport ourselves there together. I know you are tired. I know we are hurting, but the future is calling to bring us home, a home on a planet that's healed, existing in sustainable systems where society and environment <clears throat> are harmonious. I'm heading towards building a future and a home where all of us can be safe within. Let's get there. Let's build there together. <clears throat> I wish you could um, do the whole performance <laughs> of us. Well, we're only here till uh, today or some of us on the 10th. Um, but we'll see, maybe you could come to the Philippines too <laughs> one day. And, you know, uh, I, 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 I'm interested in what could that mean. Um, Arfan, I'm, I'm interested with this, vigor, this um, grit you have. And uh, where have you landed? In, in what spaces have you articulated this um, clarities? Well, thank you very much. Uh, that's a very good question. Actually, um, as I said, when I was very young, very young, I was... Uh, involved with this kind of uh, amazing, uh, I mean, panel discussions. We had open discussions when I was very young. So um, since I came to the United States, um, I was working with an organization called Learn Serve International. Mm -hmm. So it was an opportunity that was given to me, and I was, uh, I tried to, uh, because I've been through a lot of things. I was traumatized. I was like, I, I was. I was uh, thinking about my country, my home country, Afghanistan. I was thinking about the people, all not the people in Afghanistan, all the people around the world, they're suffering because of uh, this kind of uh, issues and problems. Um, and after that, so uh, it, it has been like three or four months that I'm uh, working individually, I'm, I'm trying to build up awareness among our community, among uh, uh, the high schools, and I, I have some partners that uh, we will found an organization uh, this summer, and we will try to uh, first build up awareness and to campaign for climate change. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 because it's a very good opportunity for me uh, as Maya said, that we share this planet. Yes, uh, this is our home. We all have the responsibility to take action to stop climate change. Yeah. And I, I have that feeling. I have that, uh, that obligation towards my planet, towards the, life of, the lives of our next generation, mm -hmm. that we have to uh, create a change. I'm cutting from one of the uh, greatest leaders uh, of the world. His name is Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm. He says, if you want to see the change, first you have to be the change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have to start with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then we have to change our community. Mm -hmm. And that's, what, that's why 
I'm always thinking about climate change and about uh, uh, environment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, yes. Go on. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. <laughs> I'm just also like, because as I've said, like we, we are uh, in a very interesting moment here to be able to like uh, share all your stories to the people. Um, but I also want to get to, to uh, Kio. Um, you were talking about this as, in a way, as an embodied um, uh, you know, practice. Like when yes. we, we talk about it, but also, and Kio works with the body as, as, as a medium. Is that correct, Kio? So perhaps you could share as well to us um, through some of your slides. Yeah, okay. Like uh, um, your work. Okay. So, Maybe if you could put it on, Maybe thank you. you. Could, like, yeah, help uh, Kiyo. Okay. But uh, first, uh, like, Kiyo, how do you respond to this? Um, well, as, as, I wa as I mentioned before, I mentioned pollinators. And so during lockdown, I started to read the words of Anna Tsing and Donna Hathaway and about their concepts on multi species companionship and collaborative survival. And so I decided that I wanted to make an alliance with an endangered species. And I chose uh, the Apis mellifera bee, which are honeybees. And uh, because a friend of mine, he's an apiculture, and he, he was, he's working with bees, and he said that the bees that he had at the city were much more healthy than the bees that he had at the outskirts of the city. And I was like, what, how? I mean, it's a polluted city and they're in the field, so. And he was like, I, I think it's because of the, they don't use that much pesticides in the city as they are using now in the outskirts with all this monoculture that I already talked to you about. So I saw this gap to enter there, like to talk about the city as a refugee for pollinators and for bees. So uh, I decided to invite a queen bee to establish her colony in the rooftop of my house, her new home. And uh, on the day of their arrival, it was more than 40,000 bees and the queen. Um, I, to, to make a seal of this multi-species alliance, I offered the hive a mask of my face and I put it inside the hive so the bees would uh, finish sculpting the mask. And, with like honey, pollen, what will you see now? Um, yeah. Let me show you. <clears throat> so this is the day the bees arrived and this is their house. And now we have like more than four stories. So they've been growing a lot. And then that's the mask. And two months after uh, I, I gave them the mask, well, th these, are, these are the bees working like on the mask. And then, it's a collaboration we did. Yeah. There they are. <laughs> when we met, like, Kiyo was looking for, was it Queen Bee? Uh, the first time we met online. Ah, uh, yeah, I was looking for a Queen Bee. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then, well, this is the, re the end result. And it was really interesting, because it's like they decided to, like, <clears throat> Because what I wanted to do with this mask was like to, to make, uh, to question the, the binaries that they told us they're rigid on like nature, culture, mm -hmm. human, animal, the self and the other. Mm -hmm. And I found that, that it was really interesting that they decided to do like a half and half phase. So there's pollen, there's honey that's ready. The honey that's not sealed is honey that has a lot of humid humidity still in there. So it's not ready to be like eaten mm. for, for the bees. And uh, there's also like cells. The, the bigger cells that you can see are for uh, male bees. And then the smaller ones are for uh, uh, feminine bees. And then, well, it's, it's a project and it's called Mujer Apis and it, it, it's through different mediums that I've been working, like multi-species performance, like photography, I'm talking about ecocide <clears throat> goes hand in hand with yeah. feminicide. <clears throat> and there's also uh, like 
uh, sculpture and ceramics, and this is a project, it's called A Room of One's Own, and these are refu refugees for wild beasts. And they look for cavities, like tubular cavities, in different places, but because right now uh, we are experimenting a lot of habitat loss, mm -hmm. they, there's not enough cavities, so these cavities that are like the nipples, like in, in the form of a breast, that's where they can go, rest, and mm -hmm. nest. So that's why it's called a room of one zone, yeah. and it was like placed in a park in, very, in various, uh, in different parks of the city. Mm. And then to finish off, uh, I would like to show you this work in progress. It's sounds recorded from the hive and manipulated and then like uh, with my voice on it. So there you go. like for a moment there I felt very sticky <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it, this is a, a nice um, flow no I uh, we started with the, uh, this excerpt from a performance a theater performance and then you know how your work with the youth um, intersects with your um, activism and and your performance art is in fact like also an embodied lived experience and activism and now we're on the bees as a way to decenter ourselves from the top of the ecology. Um, I, I'm reminded of the ocean <laughs> filibuster then embodied like <clears throat> in your piece, Katie. Sure. Um, now we're, we're going to that. We're going to the ocean from the beast. It's true. I'm so <clears throat> inspired by <laughs> all of you. I'm yeah. just really, really grateful to be here. Before we get to the ocean, though, <laughs> I think I want yeah, to talk please. about the forest. Forest. Um, so I wanted to show and share a little bit of two pieces of Pearl de Moore's. Um, and the first one I want to share is called How to Build a Forest. And it's an eight hour performance installation where on a bare stage, the audience can come in and <coughs> witness seven people building very slowly and obsessively a, for a fabricated forest um, made out, largely made out of petroleum projects products. Mm -hmm. um, over the course of six and a half hours, people can come and go, they can get up close, they can sit and watch. It's, it's um, complete for half an hour and then the whole thing gets taken away in the last hour. So it starts from, from a bare stage and ends on a bare stage. And if we can play that video, I have the eight hours compressed to like a minute and 12 seconds. <laughs> and on one side of the screen, on the left side, you'll see sort of the whole thing. And then on the right side, you'll see these um, close-up moments. 
And one of the things we were, we were interested in, in a couple things, but we were, Lisa, my collaborators from New Orleans, and, and this was in, you know, 2006, we were really reeling from Hurricane Katrina. Also, the BP oil spill was around that time, and we wanted to think about how theater, how we as theater artists could really respond to that. And we started to think about how long it takes something to um, emerge in the natural world, and how, or a city, frankly, and how quickly it can be eradicated. And so the framework of an eight-hour workday where humans can go in and like take the top off a mountain that took hundreds of years to, to get to that point, the hubris of that was something we were interested in exploring. And then also in terms of theater, conventional theater making, all this time and resource goes into making something. The audience sees the very top. And then it all gets thrown out. And so we were interested in flipping that script and inviting the audience into the process of making, decentering like the final perfect view. Um, and uh, so after we did that project, we, we were really interested in how to bring people in in this way. So rather than sitting back and watching that you were, you were part of that system, you were part of that system. More recently, and actually right now I'm in the middle of um, shepherding a tour of our latest project called Ocean Filibuster, yes. where, we, where we wanted to use the tools of theater, video, lights, storytelling, sound, music, to um, create a, a mythological story where the audience could contemplate this imagined or, or real, perhaps future, um, in, in 40, 50, 60 years time, whenever it's gonna happen. So I'm gonna show uh, about four minutes, if that's okay, feel free to stop us, of this piece, Ocean Filibuster, and uh, in the piece, the audience walks into a theater that is set up to be um, a global senate, a future global senate called the um, Global Federation of Humans on Earth. Mm -hmm. And they meet a character called Mr. Majority, who is proposing a bill to end the oceans as we know them. It, he calls it the new seven seas. He proposes to shrink the world's oceans down into manageable and marketable lagoons. He has all sorts of systems of how we're gonna get rid of the water, develop the land that's left behind, and turn to human engineering, science, and technology to do all the jobs the ocean does. And when he opens the bill up for debate, the first person who shows up to speak against the bill is the ocean in human form. So you're going to see just a little of the, of the two of them and one of the methods the ocean uses to bring people into their world. So go ahead. Today is a good day. Wherefore the ocean, she has descended into unfathomable chaos. And wherefore New York City is now a small island of memorials. And Osaka is a deep water tourist attraction accessed by submersible musk mobiles. And wherefore the seat of global government is now split between Geneva and Seattle. We, the members of the global Senate, come together today to vote on the most important piece of legislation of my time. The End of Ocean Bill. I want you to go with me to a place beneath the sea. Carved out from the water, the land will be set free. Sudden hills and mountains and valleys where you stand. You watch your sons and daughters as they populate this land. No more troubled oceans, only placid lakes and streams, refineries and wheat fields as far as you can see. No more sinking, no more swimming, you can ask for more. No more drowning in self-pity, it's time for you to soar. From the country called Pacific to the mountain. Bermuda. Thank you for the floor, Mr. Majority. <laughs> and for laying out the bill so clearly without a smidgen of manipulation, I roll. And uh, I am grateful to have this time to speak on my behalf. And yes, when I say my, I do mean my. 
Because I am the ocean. Deeper. Into your watery self. Deep blue. Dark blue. Blue. Black. And maybe you hear. And you're like, oh my god, help, what is that? As a missile test explodes somewhere over there. You don't know it's a missile test. You don't have those words. Because you are a stoplight loose jaw dragonfish in the mesopelagic zone of me. How far down are we? Well, in human terms, about 1,800 feet. It's cold and totally dark, but that doesn't matter much to you when the blinking red and green lights just below each of your eyes. Bioluminescence, light produced by a living organism. Your phytoplankton have been declining for years thanks to your rising temperatures. Exactly, and you know, you know why. Can we please pull up the ocean disaster notification system? Thank you. Let's take a look, shall we? The day we woke up to no ocean. The day we woke up to the dry bed. See the expanses of trembling coral under the shadows of new mountain ranges. What is this? <laughs> you cannot ask for help. This isn't help. This is part of me, all of me, the mix of me. It's become impossible to translate my immensity with just one voice. This filibuster is under my purview, and Mr. Mr. Majority, Majority Chill. <laughs> oh, thank you, um, Katie. Wow. It's very interesting that you have turned this into a musical in which, like, you know, literally, like, to hear the ocean sing. Yeah. Like, if, you know, um, and at this point, um, I know it's a surprise that we have come to almost to uh, the end of. Um, definitely, if uh, my dream would have to deepen this um, further into the solutions, perhaps, that we think, right? And then I reflect, well, I was looking at this like, the solution is already like we are doing it, in a way. Um, so I'd rather us step into a few seconds of sharing what is either a dream or an invitation to the community we have here in this moment, which I could definitely count by my, you know, multiple uh, fingers. Um, yeah, as we close, perhaps you could either like share, how do you want to move forward with this or how do we want to invite um, our community here with a gathering into your world or into our earth, <laughs> um, maybe, Kyo, uh, the, like a, mm. a sentence or two would be so sweet. <laughs> uh, well, bees communicate by dancing, you know? Like, they would tell each other how far their food source is by <laughs> doing, <laughs> and I'm gonna yeah. do it Get for you, the waggle dance. <laughs> So I invite you to do it, <laughs> and it'll make you feel better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gio. Um, Katie, um, is there anything? Sure. I think I invite all of us to start letting go of the word I. Yeah. That, um, that we are also a community in, within our own bodies, mm. and then in every step throughout that. So to take care of the ocean, to take care of the environment, to take care of the cities, the air, it is the same thing as taking care of our own selves. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think that uh, first I have to say that, uh, as I said, 
I mean, we all have the responsibility to take action and to change ourselves and to change our mindsets. Uh, we have, because we all have the responsibility mm -hmm. to uh, save and protect all, our world. I think uh, all of us know what are the solutions. All of us, we all know that what are the impacts of climate change, mm -hmm. how, how we can stop that. Uh, I wanna uh, point out to Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, mm -hmm. which two weeks ago, he said that we have three more years mm -hmm. to stop climate change. <laughs> but I think mm -hmm. if we would have three more minutes, three more minutes, these leaders, the world leaders, would not stop climate change if we would have just three more minutes chance to stop climate change. These leaders would not stop climate change. I'm pretty sure. And from, uh, for the poor countries like Afghanistan, uh, I wanna say that uh, please help those countries as well as we care about <coughs> climate change overall because those countries are being impacted mostly by climate change. Mm -hmm. If the United States here burning fossil fuels, using gases, using oil, it impacts Afghanistan and Philippines on the other side of the world. And we have to care about those countries as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're fine. I guess as we're closing, <laughs> I do want to thank you all again. I'm just filled with so much gratitude to be here with you guys and all of that, the art and the ideas and, and the relevance and the realness and the urgency and all that is coming, change is coming and we are doing it actively every day as we embody ourselves, embodying our world. Um, I guess what I would like to leave us with is going back to to what, what has been shared in this conversation, which is both listening internally, listening externally to the world around you, and, and then still finding <clears throat> sustainability, peace, and balance. Our world is literally coming from a global pandemic. Our world's climate crisis is a sign that collectively we are sick. And we are coming from a history that was structured to not be sustainable and healthy and just. But we collectively have an opportunity, as we've all shared, to make that change happen. And it has to, and it's going to. So find rest, find peace, find sustainability. It's coming your way, it's coming our way. And I am excited. <clears throat> I am excited uh, from the B dance to the we <laughs> dance to listening to excitement. Yes, this work can be tiring and exhausting and for some perhaps, you know, the conversations now echo anxiety and all that. But all of these feelings and emotions all come from a place of love, I believe. Um, in our collective, we, uh, we honor anger uh, and um, grief trauma, all coming from a place because we care, because we love, right? This is all different rhythms of the heart in which if, if we only understand that we are mad at this because we care so much for life and not just, but this time not just for us, you know? Actually, other species are gonna be just fine after us. <laughs> it's us too, it's our families. Um, I think I wanna pick up from, from all of these wonderful sharing, um, uh, that this is not really closing. This is a continuation, uh, rather an invitation to, to grow the community and to start from where there is love. Um, uh, where, start from where you are. Um, say, um, I was uh, at the one workshop last time with uh, Miranda, um, and like, where do you really start? There's so many problems, but start, start where you are right now. Start where you're aligned. Um, and when the mind and heart and body aligns, I think that uh, you are in the right space. Um, lastly, I haven't really shared much with, with what I do in the country, but anyway, it, it continues to go on. I'm working with institutions there. As NFC said, this is a strategic game, a long game. So, <laughs> so the key is really to like have the stamina for this 
and looking at this, focusing the next 10, 20 years of otherwise there are irreparable damage and too late to, um, if, you know, to look back and say, we have not done anything, you know, so I can wait for all these like fabulous things that could happen in the arts and just like, devote ourselves within the climate. And we were talking about this, Katie, like, all the things that we fight for somehow is reduced to this idea that our home is a threat. Our home is a threat. And so, you know, just like the pandemic that have deprived us of the space to share stories in these spaces with the climate, it's a slow kill to our lives, to our food systems, to everything. And um, as I mentioned about the intersections we work on, we cannot work on the climate um, ecological healing without really working on global justice. We cannot. And we cannot work on global justice if we cannot work on a culture of care. Mm -hmm. It's just impossible to care. Um, I, it's just impossible to achieve justice without really caring. And I think this, these are the moments when we are allowed and invited to care a little more, perhaps to see different lens. And I am so honored and grateful to share, with, uh, to share this space with you today, to learn from you, to continue the conversation, to imagine a better world for us, to dissenter ourselves from this egocentric system, patriarchal system that has all brought us here in this damage. So thank you so much. There is hope um, in this because here you are present here in this space. Thank you so much. stamina we have one more event today you have a little break and then we will be back uh, we will really begin at 3 30 because this event involves um, collaborators who are joining us on zoom from other places in the world so please come back a little before 3 30 like say 3 23 25 so we can really get started at 3 30 uh, we will have this like that last one. discussion around migration and children and the refugee experience and then our closing rituals for the festival. See you then. <laughs> <laughs>